If you have a Bible this morning, I want to invite you to turn with me to Genesis chapter 41. We spent last month, and we're continuing this month, looking at the story of Joseph, which is found in the last quarter of the book of Genesis. And we've said that this story is really one about God's providence. From the beginning of the story, God foretold what he was going to do in Joseph's life, but so far, we've only seen Joseph experience really hardships and suffering and seasons of waiting. In fact, we left off last week in Genesis chapter 40 when Joseph is still in prison for a crime that he did not commit. And although God used him to interpret dreams from a, a cupbearer and a baker that were assistants to the king, he was not lifted out of prison. For two years, he stayed there waiting for God to move. But in this chapter, in chapter 41, we see his story begin to take a turn. We see this dramatic kind of change where so far Joseph's story has really just been going down into the pit and down into Egypt and down into prison. Now we see God begin to change his story, to, to begin to lift him up by his providence. And I want to read for us from Genesis chapter 41, we're going to read verses 1 through 42, which isn't the whole chapter, but it is a long passage of Scripture. But I think it's good for us to take a few minutes and really hear from the Word of the Lord. So Genesis chapter 41, verses 1 through 42. It says that after two whole years, Pharaoh dreamed that he was standing by the Nile. Behold, there came up out of the Nile seven cows, attractive and plump. And they fed in the reed grass. And behold, seven other cows, ugly and thin, came up out of the Nile after them and stood by the other cows on the bank of the Nile. And the ugly, thin cows ate up the seven attractive, plump cows. And Pharaoh awoke, and he fell asleep and dreamed a second time. And behold, seven ears of grain, plump and good, were growing on one stalk. And behold, after them sprouted seven ears, thin and blighted by the east wind. And the thin ears swallowed up the seven plump, full ears. Pharaoh awoke, and behold, it was a dream. So in the morning, his spirit was troubled. He, spent, he sent and called all the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men. Pharaoh told them his dreams, but there was no one who could interpret them to Pharaoh. Then the chief cupbearer said to Pharaoh, I remember my offenses today. When Pharaoh was angry with his servant, servants and put me and the chief baker in the custody of the house of the captain of the guard, we dreamed on the same night, he and I, each having a dream with its own interpretation. A young Hebrew was with us, a servant of the captain of the guard. When we told him, he interpreted our dreams to us, giving us an interpretation to each man according to his dream. And as he interpreted to us, so it came about. I was restored to my office and the baker was hanged. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph and they quickly brought him out of the pit. And when he had shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came in before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream, and there was no one who can interpret it. I have heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Joseph answered Pharaoh, it is not me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, behold, in my dream, I was standing out on the banks of the Nile. Seven cows, plump and attractive, came out of the Nile and fed in the reed grass. Seven other cows came up after them, poor and very ugly and thin, such as I had never seen in all the land of Egypt. And the thin, ugly cows ate up the first seven plump cows. But when they had eaten them, no one would have known that they had eaten them, for they were still as ugly as the beginning. Then I awoke. I also saw in my dream seven ears growing on one stalk, full and good. Seven ears, withered, thin, and blighted by the east wind, sprouted up after them. And the thin ears swallowed up the seven good ears. And I told it to the magicians, but there was no one who could explain it to me. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years. The seven good ears are seven years. The dreams are one. The seven lean and ugly cows that came up after them are seven years. And the seven empty ears blighted by the east wind are also seven years of famine. It is as I told Pharaoh, God has shown to Pharaoh what he is about to do. There will come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt. But after them, there will arise seven years of famine. 
and all the plenty will be forgotten in the land of Egypt. The famine will consume the land, and the plenty will be unknown in the land by the reason of the famine that will follow, for it will be very severe. And the doubling of Pharaoh's dream means that, this, that the thing is fixed by God, and God will shortly bring it about. Now therefore, let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh proceed to appoint overseers over the land and take one-fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt during the seven plentiful years. Let them gather all the food of these good years that are coming up and store up grain under the authority of Pharaoh for food in the cities and let them keep it. That food shall be a reserve for the land against the seven years of famine that are to occur in the land of Egypt so that the land may not perish through the famine. This proposal pleased Pharaoh and all his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find a man like this in whom is the spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has shown you all this, there is none none so discerning and wise as you. You shall be over my house. And all my people shall order themselves as you command. Only as regards the throne, I will be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all of the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh took a signet ring from his hand, put it on Joseph's hand, clothed him in garments of fine linen, and put a gold chain about his neck. You know, throughout this study, we tried to remind ourselves that the hero of this story is not Joseph, but God. That Joseph is lifted up to us as an example, but really his example is that we should have faith in God. And it's really clear that it is God's presence with Joseph and God's purposes in Joseph's life that causes all the things to happen. And in fact, what we're seeing in this part of the story is really clear that it's not just that God is sovereign and providential over Joseph's life, but God is sovereign and providential over all things that happen, even famines that come to a land. One thing that you have to keep in mind as we read this portion of the story is this is really the first time in Joseph's story that we're introduced to Pharaoh. We heard about Pharaoh a little bit last chapter as we saw the the servants, the cupbearer and the baker of Pharaoh brought into prison and then one was promoted back and one was beheaded. But we don't really know much about Pharaoh. Here we are introduced to him more. And you have to keep in mind when you read this passage about Pharaoh and his kind of interaction in this story that In the Egyptian culture, the Pharaoh was not just a a king or a political ruler, but the Pharaoh was also a spiritual leader or a religious leader. I think at different times throughout the Egyptian dynasty, there were different kind of ways of viewing the Pharaoh. At certain times, I think the Pharaoh was viewed as a mediator between the gods and the people, kind of a god in the flesh who was to make known to the people the will of the gods. But other times, it might have been even more clear that Pharaoh himself was viewed as a god, a god amongst the people. And here, Pharaoh is not really seen much as a god. Here, Pharaoh is humbled. He's in distress. He's perplexed. All of his magicians and wise men can't make sense of these dreams. It's showing that Pharaoh is not only unsure about what he's dreaming about, but he is unsure about what it means. He's unsure about what the future holds. But it becomes really clear in this passage that the God of Joseph, the God of Jacob and Isaac and Abraham, he's not only giving dreams and giving interpretations of dreams, but he is directing the events of the future. See, I think this passage is reminding us that there is a God in Egypt, but it wasn't the Pharaoh and it wasn't the gods that the Pharaoh was supposed to be able to point the people to to follow their will, but it was the one true God. Yahweh, Jehovah, the Lord God Almighty, is the one God in Egypt, which means he's the one God in the whole world. I think in many ways, this passage foreshadows what is going to happen some 400 years later, when God comes and reminds that Pharaoh and those people in Egypt that he alone is God, as he rescues his people out of slavery, brings them out of Egypt to the promised land. See, this passage is reminding us that it's not just Joseph's story, but it is God's story, as God is working all things together for good. And I think it is Joseph's faith in God. It is Joseph's belief that there is a God in Egypt, but it's not the Pharaoh, and it's not the gods of the Egyptians. It's the one true God. It's Joseph's belief in this that allows him to do the things that we see in this passage and in the passages to come. 
reason Joseph is able to interpret the dreams and speak to Pharaoh in this way is because he believes that there really is one God who is above all and before all and who is over all things. The question I think is, do we believe that? Do we live with that type of faith that Joseph has? So many times I think in our culture today, we aren't tempted to maybe believe in idols and other deities like in the Egyptian culture. There may not be a Pharaoh that we are called to to worship or view as divine, but there are many times in our culture and in our lives where we are tempted to not believe that God is sovereign and in control. There are many times in our lives we are tempted to, I think, trust in maybe ourselves or the, the wisdom from the world rather than what God is doing and what he has revealed. And I think this passage reminds us that there is a God who is over all. And this passage gives us an example of what does it look like to live with faith in this God? And so I want to lay out for us from this passage four steps that we see from Joseph, four uh, ways of an example that Joseph gives us to, to live in faith that there really is one God who is over all. The first step is that, that we would need to trust in God's timing. Trust in the timing of God. I think if we really believe that there is a God who is over all and before all and above all, that we would trust in his timing. Now, last week, Pastor Clark spent a, 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 did a great job, I thought, of unpacking Genesis 40 and really developing that theme of what does it look like to wait on the Lord and trust in God's timing. And so I don't want to spend a lot of time on this point today, but I do think it's worth mentioning because the passage begins by reminding us in verse one, it says that after two whole years, don't you love that the way that that's written? Not just two years, but two whole years It had been 13 years since God had first revealed to Joseph that he had a plan for him to be lifted up. It had been two years since God had used Joseph to interpret the dreams of the cupbearer and the baker, but yet Joseph had been waiting. Joseph had to wait two more years, two whole years, until he got called up to the palace. But it's clear, for whatever reason, God had Joseph wait those 13 years or those two years that God's timing was perfect. This was the perfect time for Joseph to get called up to Pharaoh's uh, palace, to be before Pharaoh, to interpret these dreams. This was the perfect timing for Joseph to interpret the dreams for Pharaoh, for Joseph to be put into this position of authority, that he might save the people of Egypt and his own family during this time of famine. For whatever reason God had Joseph waiting up until this point, it's really clear in this passage that God's timing is perfect. That's something that we need to keep in mind in our own lives, that God's timing is perfect. And I know that sounds a bit cliche. And I know that that's hard to believe whenever you're having to wait, whenever you're having to to go through a season in which it seems like God's timing is not according to what you would want him, him to do or according to what seems best in that moment. But God's timing really is perfect. And I think just one thing we can keep in mind is that God has a different perspective of time and of timing than we do. There is a gap between what God understands about time and and timing than what we can understand. You know, last week when Pastor Clark was talking about waiting on God, he was talking about how difficult it is for us to wait, especially in our culture with everything is so on demand. And I think he even referenced that sometimes it's really hard to wait with young children. It can be hard for them to wait. And I found one of the hardest things about having kids wait is that they don't always understand the measurements of time. And sometimes my kids will ask me, well, how much longer until dinner's ready or until we leave? And I'll say 10 minutes. And they'll say, what does that mean? And I'll say, well, if you count to 60, 10 times, that's about when it's going to be ready. Or sometimes they'll say, well, like, well, how much longer till we leave on this trip? And I'll say a week. And they'll say, well, what does that mean? And I'll say seven sleeps, right? So we, we count by the number of sleeps that we've taken those nights to, to get there. And the Bible says that the gap between God's understanding of time and ours is far greater than the gap between my understanding of time and my kids. God has a totally different perspective on timing. In fact, Peter reminds us in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, that we should not overlook this one fact, beloved. That with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. 
As we wait for the Lord to return, it will seem like he is delayed. When you wait for the Lord to act in your life, it might seem like he is too early or too late. When it seems like everything's coming at you at once, you would wonder, why does God time things like he does? You have to remember he has a greater perspective than you do, that his timing is perfect. If there really is a God in Egypt, if there really is a God in the world who is above all and before all and over all, then you have to admit that he knows a little bit more about the right time than you do. And so to live with faith in that God would be to trust in his timing, trust that his timing is perfect. But not only would we trust that God works things according to his time, but that he also works things according to what he knows to be true. And that's really the the second step that I think Joseph gives us as as an example in this chapter, that we would rely on the truth of God, that we would trust in the the timing of God, but also we would rely on the, the truth of God. You know, one of the major themes of Joseph's story is these dreams. Now, if you notice, they always seem to come in two. Joseph, in the beginning, had two dreams. Then when he was in prison, the the, the cupbearer and the baker each had a dream. Two dreams were presented. And now Pharaoh has two dreams. There's these dreams that are, are taking place. And for Dreams to be seen as a way of revealing information, it might seem kind of strange in our culture, but it was very acceptable in this culture. It was very expected that dreams would be used by a divine being to reveal something to someone. Dreams were often taken to be a a source of revelation. And that's why there were magicians and there were wise men who were going to interpret these dreams. There were actually guidebooks in the Egyptian culture that showed which symbols and images meant certain things and how dreams were to be understood. So this isn't all that strange in this culture, but what is kind of interesting as you read these passages is how did nobody understand what these dreams meant? I mean, if you read Genesis 41, granted, we've got a lot of hindsight as we look back, but it seems kind of obvious what maybe these dreams might mean. In fact, if you go back and read the dreams in Genesis 40 of the the cupbearer and the baker, you might say, well, these dreams don't seem that hard to understand. A lot of people have speculated, why did the magicians and the wise men, why were they not able to understand what was being uh, revealed in these dreams? And I've come across two answers that people have put forth that I think they could be right. One, people have said, maybe actually the magicians and the wise men did understand what these dreams meant, but they didn't want to tell Pharaoh that they knew what these dreams meant. Because nobody wants to be the bearer of bad news. I mean, imagine if you're the one who could tell Pharaoh that there is going to be some good years in Egypt, but then there's going to be this seven years of famine. Famines were seen as curses. If you are the one who spoke this, maybe you are seen as the one who is bringing the curse upon the land. So maybe they understood it. Maybe they just didn't speak it because it was bad news. That could be the case. I I think maybe what's more likely is that God had chosen to use some type of symbols or imagery, something in the way that he presented it, that it was not clear to the people of that day. That all their guidebooks and all their wisdom was not, they were not able to understand what God was revealing in the dreams. And, And that's what God was intending that God was purposefully masking the the point of these dreams from those who would seek the, the wisdom of the world, if you will. And that is why Joseph is needed, because when Joseph is called upon, he's not gonna go to the guidebooks of the Egyptians to figure out what the imagery is. And he's not going to shrink back from sharing the the, the news of the dreams just because it's unpopular or bad news. He's going to share what God has revealed in the dreams. And he actually makes that really clear. Pharaoh brings Joseph before him and he says, I hear that you can interpret dreams. What does Joseph say in verse 16? It is not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. Most likely when he says a favorable answer, I don't think he means God's gonna give him a good answer or it's going to be good news. I think he means that Pharaoh is gonna find rest for his troubled spirit because God's going to answer the question for him. Through Joseph, God is going to reveal the truth of these dreams. But it's really interesting, I think, that Joseph gives us an example here of not relying on the wisdom of the world or not shrinking back from the truth that God is revealing because it might be bad news or unpopular, but to stand really clearly on God's truth in this moment. I mean, imagine having to stand before a Pharaoh 
a leader of the most powerful nation on the planet at this point, and to say, well, this is what God has said is going to come to pass. There is a God in the world and you are not him. I mean, he is having to really trust that, that this is the truth of God and he is having to be bold in speaking the truth of God. But if we really believe that there is a God who is above all, who is before all and over all, if there's really a God in Egypt and a God in the world, then why would we not rely on his truth? Why would we turn to the wisdom of the world, to the wisdom of man, rather than the wisdom of God, the truth of God? It's not always that what the world says is opposed to what God says. Sometimes the world speaks truth. But the question is, are we going to view what we are looking at in the world through the lens of God's truth? Are we going to allow our understanding of what is true and right to be shaped by what God reveals to us? Are we going to trust more in the wisdom of God or in our own wisdom or in the wisdom of the world? The question is, what are you trusting in? What are you relying upon? I think Joseph is giving us an example that if we really believe that there is one true God, then we have to rely on his truth. And I think these first two parts of the example really lead to the third. That if we really believe that there is a God, then we have to trust that he's working according to his timing. If we really believe that there's a God, then we have to trust that what he is revealing to be true is right and good, that we should build our lives upon it. And that means then when God gives us an an opportunity, I believe that we should take it. So the third example, I think, is that we would take opportunities from God. If we really trust that God, his timing is perfect, that his truth is what is sure and what is right, then I think we would need to take the opportunities that come from God. When God opens a door, I think we should walk through it. And I think this is an important part for us to consider in Joseph's story because so much of Joseph's story is about waiting. For 13 years, Joseph had been waiting. For two years, even after being used by God in the prison, he was waiting. And it's important for us, as we talked about last week, to learn to wait on the Lord, to be patient and trust his timing. But I think it's also important for us to take action when the Lord gives us a command, to take an opportunity when the Lord opens a door. But sometimes we are called to wait, but sometimes we are called to act. Sometimes we are called to take an opportunity. It's very clear here that Joseph is given this opportunity from God. Now, here's the thing I think would be the natural question for us to ask. How do we know if an opportunity is from God? I mean, it's really clear in Joseph's story, right? Like Joseph is in prison and now he's got this chance to interpret Pharaoh's dreams and be put into this position that had been foretold. It's really clear for Joseph. But what about for us? How do we know if an opportunity is from God or not from God? And people often will come to me and ask just for guidance as a pastor. They'll say, you know, is how do I know if this is the will of God for me? How do I know if it's right for me to, to take this? Is Is every job opportunity an opportunity from God? Is every time someone approaches you about serving in a ministry at the church, is that an opportunity from God? Is any time that someone comes to you because they are in need and you can help them, is that an opportunity from God? How do we we know what's an opportunity from God? I think actually the answer, just sorry to disappoint you a little bit, is that there's probably no black and white clear answer. What I often tell people is, well, I don't think that's the way God works, that you can just kind of figure out what exactly is his will for your life and just take those steps all the time. I don't know if it's always clear if there's an opportunity that's and if it's really from God, but I do think Joseph's story gives us some examples, some, some guidance that we could follow. Now, this isn't all that I would say. I think there's more in scripture for us to consider as we think about our opportunities from God. But here's a few things from this passage that I think we consider, we can consider as as we weigh the the decision, is is an opportunity from God. One thing I think we can ask ourselves is, is this opportunity in line with who God has made me to be? Is this opportunity in line with how God has gifted me, with the abilities he's given me, with the experience that he's given me? I mean, I think it's no coincidence that dreams have played an important part in Joseph's life. God had revealed to him his future in dreams. He's now interpreted dreams while he's in the prison. And so it seems really clear that as he gets called up to Pharaoh, this is what God has been preparing him for. This is what God has equipped him to do in terms of understanding and interpreting these dreams. 
And so I think it's the same for us. I think many times we know an opportunity is from God because it is in line with who God has equipped us to be. God has given each one of us gifts and abilities, and he will give us opportunities, I think, that match those. That happens in our lives, in our work. It happens in the church. The Bible says that the church is made up of many members, that we are a body. It's not just about one person or a few people doing the work, but rather it's the whole body working together, that each member has been gifted, has different abilities to serve God in unique ways. Are you using your gifts and abilities to serve the Lord? Sometimes we might be using our time and our efforts on other things, and so we're not open to when God has an opportunity for us that is in line with who we are. But I do think one of the ways that we can see that an opportunity is from God, it is in line with who he has created us to be, how he has equipped us and gifted us. Another way that I think we know that an opportunity might be from God is that it gives us the opportunity to speak the truth of God. One of the ways I think we know that God's opening a door is that it's really clear that we have the opportunity to speak God's truth in that moment. You think about the opportunity that Joseph has here, not just to say that the interpretations of the dreams come from God, but even what is going to happen in the future comes from God. I mean, listen to what Joseph says in verse 25. He says, the dreams of Pharaoh are one. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. This is a unique opportunity for Joseph to stand before Pharaoh and speak the truth of God. I think a lot of times we'll know an opportunity is from God because it gives us a chance to speak about God or speak about the truth of God. Sometimes these opportunities might be big. You might be invited to speak before many different people, for a large group, before someone significant like Joseph has a chance before Pharaoh. But many times I think these opportunities are quite small. Maybe it's just to a coworker or to a friend. Maybe it's to a neighbor or your Uber driver. Maybe it's just a small opportunity that God gives you to speak his truth, but we should not see any opportunity as too big or too small. I think it's an opportunity from God if it gives us the chance to speak about God and the truth that he has revealed. And third, I think we can know that a, an opportunity is, is from God if it allows us to be a blessing to others. We can know that I think that an opportunity is coming from God when it's not just about how it helps us, but how it helps others. You notice as Joseph gets this opportunity from God, he, he tells what the dream means, but then he actually gives some advice on how Pharaoh should plan for the future. You notice what Joseph doesn't do is he doesn't say, well, why don't you hire me to be your number two, and then I'll tell you how I would do this. Isn't that the way you're supposed to do interviews, right? Like withhold some information. If you just give them the whole plan, why would they hire you? But Joseph doesn't seem to care about his own benefit. He just says, you should hire someone who's wise. You should put some overseers to, to plan this out. In fact, he gives them the whole plan. He says, hold, withhold one fifth during the good years. Store it up in the cities. Why? Because it will provide for people. Verse 36, he says, that food shall be a reserve for the land against the seven years of famine that are to occur in the land of Egypt so that the land may not perish through the famine. When he speaks of the land there, I don't think he's just talking about the, the crops and the ground. He's talking about the people. He is saying, God has revealed this even now so that people's lives might be preserved. This is an opportunity, not just for Joseph to get out of prison and into the palace, but for him to be a blessing to others. A lot of times we know that an opportunity is from God because it allows us to bless others. This is a good balance for us sometimes because you might say, well, someone is needed to clean the bathrooms at the church, but that's not my gifting. That's not my ability. That's not what God has called me to do. You know, I have a different role in the church. Well, maybe that's the case, but you do have to ask yourself, is this an opportunity for me to bless others? Is this an opportunity for me to be used by God for the good of other people? Many times I think we know that an opportunity is from God because it's not so focused on ourselves, but on who we can benefit this for, who we can bless with this time. Ultimately, I think what, what I'm trying to say is that these are opportunities to glorify God. And it becomes really clear that God opens up a door that he has gifted you for, that he has given you a truth to share, to be a blessing to others, and it's all for his glory. And that's really the last part of Joseph's example that I'd like for us to consider, is that we would give glory to God. 
And if we trust that God's timing is perfect and his truth is right, that we take the opportunities that he gives us to give him the glory. We walk through the doors that he opens for his glory. Again, I, th- I think it's really clear throughout Joseph's story, but especially in this passage, that it is God who is directing all things. It is God's providential plan that's bringing Joseph to the place that he is at. And here in this part, it's not just, again, that he's over Joseph's life, but that he is over all things. Again, Joseph says, this is not just about God revealing things in dreams, and it's not just about God interpreting the dreams for you, but it's actually God saying what he is going to do. We already saw that in verse 25, as he says, this is what God is going to do. Joseph reiterates that two more times. He says in verse 28, it is as I told Pharaoh, God has shown to Pharaoh what he is about to do. Then in verse 32, he tells him the doubling of Pharaoh's dream mean that, means that the thing is fixed by God and God will shortly bring it about. Again, think about this. Joseph is a young foreigner, a slave, a prisoner, standing before the most powerful man in the world. And he is telling him that there really is a God and he is in control and you need to change your life and your plans to fit what this God is going to do. Most of us feel uncomfortable saying that to our friends and family members. Would we say it to a Pharaoh? Joseph stands before Pharaoh and he gives God all the glory. Not only saying that it's God who gives the interpretations, but it's God who's in control of all things. God is going to bring this to pass. Will you bring your life in line with God's plan? Joseph is giving us a picture of giving God all the glory. And doesn't that make sense? If there really is a God in Egypt, if there really is a God in the world who is above all and before all and over all things, doesn't he deserve all the glory? Should we not give our lives to glorifying him? One of the ways I think that it could be shown in our lives is that people would look at us and they wouldn't be so impressed with us, but with God's presence in our lives. We saw a couple of chapters ago that it was really clear that God was with Joseph. So people looked at them, they could see God's presence in his life. And even now, as Pharaoh likes the plan that Joseph lays forth, he says this, verse 37, it says, the proposal pleased Pharaoh and all his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find a man like this? And whom is the spirit of God? Yes, he's impressed by Joseph's plan and Joseph's wisdom, but he recognizes that that this wisdom only comes from the spirit of God on Joseph. And just so you know, the same spirit of God who is on Joseph in these moments, is the same spirit of God that indwells each one of us as believers. God has given you his spirit that you might glorify him in everything that you do. That whether it's something big or small, no matter how the opportunity presents itself, that you would be able to give God all the glory. God is working in Joseph's life to bring himself glory to bring Joseph and all the people to good as he preserves their life, but to to bring the glory to God. He's working in a really redemptive way in Joseph's life. As we said throughout, I think Joseph's life gives us a a greater picture of the redemptive work of God. You know, I mentioned a couple weeks ago that Joseph was down two coats. He lost one to his brothers. He lost one to Potiphar's wife. But did you notice at the end of our passage today, Joseph receives a new coat. Says Pharaoh, clothed him in fine linen. He gave him a gold chain. He put his signet ring on his finger, symbolizing Joseph's new authority. It's a redemptive work that God is doing as he has brought Joseph out of the pit, out of the prison, into the palace and given him this place of authority. But as we've said throughout, this is not just about Joseph. This is about the the greater redemptive work of God. We've said throughout this study that Jesus is the true and greater Joseph. And that's not just true in Jesus's suffering and humiliation. It's also true in Jesus's exaltation. Joseph was lifted from the prison to the palace, but Jesus raised from the grave to eternal life. Joseph was put at the right hand of Pharaoh, but Jesus was put at the right hand of the heavenly father, the one true God. Joseph was put over all authority in Egypt, but Jesus says he's received all authority in heaven and on earth. 
And just as Joseph used his position and his power to provide for those who are under his care, Jesus says, if you will come to me and trust in me, I will give you rest and I will give you abundant life. Jesus has been lifted up to the greatest position. He has received the name above all names. One day, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. What that means is one day, everyone will glorify him. Why would we not start today? Why would we not give him glory in all that we do? There is one true God. There is a God in Egypt. There's one true God in the world, one Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He alone is worthy of all the glory. So let's trust that his timing is right in our lives. Let's trust that his truth is is right, even when it's unpopular or it doesn't match the wisdom of the world. Let's take the opportunities that he gives us to glorify his name.